So we're here in the garden once again, immersing ourselves in the Genesis story to see what we can learn and, and draw from and glean from. And the Genesis story from Genesis 1 on is a, a, a really interesting and unique view of life and society even today. And so we've noted that creation started with God and it continues in us. We've noted that sin entered through man's choices, but uh, God redeems us through the Jesus Christ. We recognize that work is a part of God's design for us. Hard work was a byproduct of the fall, but work uh, and putting our hands to, to something is just a part of uh, what it means to follow in God's will. And so we work hard and we understand God is with us in the midst of hard work. And so uh, this morning I want to talk about generosity which is an interesting topic in the context of the room uh, that we're in. And so real quick, I just want to note that we've already received an offering, so this is not about uh, passing a second offering or getting the buckets out. But what I do want us to do is take an inventory of our lives to look and see how generous we are. Uh, if I were to ask you this question, are you better off today than you were four years ago, many of us would take that question to mean financially. Almost inevitably, we would go, well, do I have more money today than I did four years ago? Uh, many politicians, probably not our current, uh, ask the question, are you better off today than you were four years ago, in an effort to bolster uh, praise for themselves for a strong economy. If the economy is weak, uh, obviously that question doesn't come up as often. But if I were to ask you that, you wouldn't contemplate many other things. You would just look at your bank account. You look at your 401k. You look at your stocks. You look at whatever and go, yeah, I'm better off. Because we have all been programmed and trained to think of ourselves and behave as consumers. And in fact, we are known by what we purchase. If we were to stop spending, society as we know it would come to a halt. We would not see uh, things perpetuate. We measure our success and the success of our nation uh, based on per capita income and GDP. And we are what we buy. And so we know this. We've been taught this, programmed to believe this. And so we willingly take part in the purchasing and consuming cycle. And if we stopped, we know that things would collapse. And so we just consistently take part in owning more, buying more, purchasing more. And, and, and we're invited to consume. And the problem in an environment like that is we often think that greed is the opposite of poverty. But greed is not the opposite of poverty. The opposite of greed is not poverty, it's generosity. And when Christ calls us, he calls us to be generous. And it ends up being the antidote to uh, consumerism and to greed. That we have been called to be generous, open-handed people. And the first story that explains this generosity in the Bible is the story of Cain and Abel. In Genesis 4.1, it says Adam was intimate with his wife Eve and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, I have had a male child with the Lord's help. And then she also gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now Abel became a shepherd of the flocks, but Cain, he worked the ground. In the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock in their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious and he looked despondent. Now in context, we're coming right on the heels of last week where uh, God was redeeming and putting the pieces uh, together of Adam and Eve's life again and he allowed them to have children which gave them a future and even though they disobeyed and made a mistake, God redeems them, gives them a future and a hope and here we have the future unfolding. It's Cain and it's Abel uh, and, and, and here they are uh, in, in a moment where they're hard workers. So we see where this once again plays into God's design for humanity where we work hard and, and one is working the fields and Another is raising cattle, and this is hard work. They're tilling the ground, which we know has been, uh, through the curse, has been uh, hard. And so we know this is difficult, and yet we find that Cain and Abel are both willing to give something to the Lord. Both of them in Scripture are, are presenting an offering to the Lord. They knew that this was an opportunity and a responsibility, and so Cain's sacrifice is presented in the text with not a lot of information. It merely says he gave some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord, which sounds fine. I mean, he was raising a garden, and he gave some of the produce to the Lord. He has all of this food, the yield from his hard work, and he chose to give a portion of it to God, which is exciting. And we think this is fascinating, and, and, and Cain showed up, and he gave something. And in the context of our modern society, we would probably celebrate this. Well, he gave something. 
He was obedient in his giving, and so he was generous to a point, and so at least he gave something. Something's better than nothing, and, and nothing is not okay, and so he gave something. He contributed, but Abel's offering is where we end up finding the problem with Cain's offering. Abel, it says, gave some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions, you see the word some in both passages. Cain gave some, Abel gave some. And so this leads me to believe that giving was not about quantity. It's not about how much he gave. It wasn't as if Abel gave more than Cain and God's like, well, I like more and so I'll take yours and not yours because more is better than less in everything, right? We all agree on that. Uh, there's some cookies on my desk that Darlene made me. More is better than less cookies, right? And when it comes to money, it's even greater. More is always better than less. And so if Abel had given more than Cain, we would go, yeah, God, that makes sense. You want more. But it wasn't about more. See, I love the story of the widow's mite. I don't know that I've ever actually preached an entire sermon on the widow's mite parable, but I love the story in Luke 21, verse 1. It says, and Jesus looked at us and saw the rich people putting their gifts into the treasury. It says their offerings into the temple treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two coins. So he said, truly I say to you, that this poor woman who has put in more than all, for all these out of their abundance have put in offering for God, but she has put in out of her poverty all the livelihood that she had. It's an interesting story of a woman who doesn't give near as much as everyone else. But God actually shows favor on her. I love this story because it's not about giving more, but it's about sacrificing. For some, $5 is a huge sacrifice, while others, it's nothing. For some, $500 is a sacrifice, while others, it's nothing. God is not concerned about how much you give, but about how much you sacrifice. Which sacrifice is really just a one word saying for how much we trust God in our lives. Sacrifice is simply about trust. We often think that God is about more because we're about more. I want more, so God must want more. And so we project onto God our own selfish motives and intentions, and, and we think, well, he must want more. And, and giving is simply about trust, about sacrifice. And when we hold on to our money, really what we're saying is we can do more with our money than God can. And I get it. I know how much I can do. More importantly, I know how limited I am. And so I know I can trust myself to a point. So often we'll hold our money because we believe we can do more with it. And I know people who don't tithe into a church or donate at all, and they hold their money aside, and they do good, benevolent things on their own. And that's great on the surface. However, what that does is it puts a lot of responsibility on us to see the right needs, to trust that God is showing us and, and, and using it in the right way. Also, what that does is that isolates you and me. See, I need you to give, and you need me to give. The beautiful thing about us contributing here together is that we need one another. When we separate ourselves from that need, it's now a solo activity. When giving really can be a community building, that we trust ourselves, though, many times more than God. But giving can actually be generative, if we'll allow it to be. We use our money to make more money, and often we use our money to make more money to buy more stuff. But if we're actually rethinking money, we begin to see that we can do more, God can do more with it through the context of generosity. That when we give to God in tithes and offerings, what we're saying is we trust that God can do more than we can. That through the context of community, more can transpire. That I need you, you need me, we work together. We see that God works in ways we could never do on our own. And we're seeing this right now downstairs. It's fascinating. We've raised $1,500. I don't have an extra $1,500. Some of you might, and if you do, maybe you should have taken care of it. But the reality is, we all gave just a little bit, and we saw how God used it to accomplish much more. That more can be done through community than it can alone. And we all have a buy-in. We all have stake in what's happening here. When we're contributing and we're investing, we're sacrificing and we're giving and we're praying and we're serving, we're here. There's blood, sweat, and tears, sometimes literally here. 
And so we have buy-in, but if we're honest, Cain and Abel would have had nothing to give apart from God. When we look at Cain and Abel's lives, we realize Cain would not have had the fat portion to give if there wasn't grass to grow. Grass wouldn't have grown if rains didn't come, and rains wouldn't have come if God didn't allow them. They wouldn't have had crops to grow. Uh, Cain wouldn't have had produce to uh, grow from the ground if he didn't have rain. If the uh, locust had come and consumed everything, he wouldn't have anything left over to, to give. And so God is protecting and he's providing and he's giving him an opportunity to reap a bountiful harvest knowing that he's going to be faithful to give back. But without God, we have nothing. That everything they had was from God. And if we look at our lives, so often we say, my money, my job, my bank account, my 401k, my debit card, because we have ownership. And rightfully so, you work hard and, and we work hard for our money, we keep an eye on it and we invest it well and we take care of it, we're good stewards, but we still think it's ours. Yet, you wouldn't be able to go to work if it weren't for breath in your lungs, you wouldn't be able to create and dream and imagine if it weren't for God. That God gives us the ability to do all things. We have nothing apart from God, but our primary expectation of the people that we meet is often to get something from them if we pay. So I buy merchandise from a store so that I can have it. I get health care from a physician. I get legal power from an attorney. So what do I get from God? What does God give me? We are so conditioned to have transactional relationships, I'll give you this if you give me that, that when we enter into the context of a room like this and we decide we might be generous, we wanna go, well, I need to see what's coming back to me. What am I getting for what I'm spending? And if we look at our lives and we realize everything that we have is God's, that God gave us first, God gave you breath in your lungs before you even decided if you were gonna be generous or not. God gave you form and, and shape and muscles and, and, and creative capacity to dream and imagine and build and, and earn for yourself before you even had the opportunity to decide if you'd be obedient in tithing. God gave first. He gave presupposing that we would be generous, that we do the work, but God gives us the ability for everything that we have is from God's. Therefore, everything that we have is God's and is no longer ours. And so when we say it's my money, it's really God's money. He's just asking for a portion of it back in trust and obedience. That's the interesting way that God has designed and created for us to live is that he knows that greed is going to be crouching at the door, that the sin of wanting more and, and holding and hoarding was going to be right there. So from the beginning of time, he institutes the opportunity for us to not see everything as ours, but to see it all as his. The tithe was implied with Cain and Abel, revealing to Abraham, establishing the law of Moses, but it's still revealed to us today that the tithe is still relevant in Deuteronomy 14. It says, each year you are to set a tenth of all the produce grown in your field. We find in Deuteronomy that the, the opportunity to tithe is being set up. The system is being put in place. Other versions say set a tenth or uh, a tithe, which is the same interchangeable word. Tithe means tenth. The tithe was instituted originally to support the Levites, who had uh, no tribal allocation of land. They were somewhat nomads, but the Levites were set apart to take care of the spiritual and educational responsibilities of the people. Their work was uh, physically necessary to help Meet needs to take care of the widow and, and the foreigner and the lost and the destitute. They were uh, doing the Lord's work and under the new covenant, uh, the tithe continues to support the Lord's work. We see in Deuteronomy it was supporting the Lord's work. We see today that's what it does through missionaries and through ministries and through churches and organizations. We give here because what's happening here matters. And if you're here and you believe in what God is doing, then you have a responsibility too to, uh, to, to be generous to see that God will take what's happening here and, and, and spread the gospel further. The place that you are is the place you're being fed. It's called the storehouse. And many times we don't think we can be generous and give 10%. And I was having a conversation with someone after first service, and they said, I'm so thankful that when I was very young, I started giving 10% of my income because I started learning to live on 90%. If you've never given 10%, carving out 10% is hard. And it might be more difficult now than ever where everything is more expensive. And so it is challenging. And so I encourage you to start somewhere. 
that God honors our efforts. He wants to move us towards total obedience, but he honors our efforts where we start. But the beautiful thing about the tithe is that it's a percentage. Can you imagine if the scriptures were like, everybody has to give $5,000 every week. $5,000 is a monetary value placed on it, and if you want to be a part of this, and you've got to give this amount. And a lot of us would go, well, I can't do that. I don't belong. I don't fit in. I don't have anything to contribute. Some of us would have to pick up extra work or just bail out altogether. But the beautiful thing about the tithe is the 10% is that everyone has something to give. It precludes class warfare and the politics of envy. Everyone has something that they can contribute. And above the 10%, that's an offering. And that's what we've been doing for the downstairs lately, is we've been receiving an extra amount to go down, which if tithing requires sacrifice, an offering requires a greater sacrifice. But the greater the sacrifice, the greater the miracle. What I've always seen is that God does his best work in the context of sacrifice. But it's not about amounts, God bless you. It's about sacrifice. It's not about the number, how many zeros come behind the number, but it's about the sacrifice that we are making, about how much we're willing to trust God in our lives. He's not asking for us to give him 100% and, and live poor. That would be irresponsible, but he's inviting us to trust him in this. Trouble, though, developed in the Old Testament when the people held out on their tithes. Uh, they were not obedient to God's law and they kept back uh, from giving to God's service. And so uh, the ministry that the Lord was trying to do was being hindered. What God wanted to create and do was being halted or it had a ceiling that when we don't tithe, we reduce ministry of Christ down to what we're willing to give. So if we have $100, there's no way to work it out. We only have $100. And we trust that God will provide and he does uh, when, when Deanna Becker passed and she donated her estate to our church, it was fantastic. Uh, we were able to uh, have a nice uh, financial boost, but it doesn't mean that we don't still give on a regular basis. Deanna's sacrifice and her generosity doesn't mean we don't sacrifice and we don't become generous. And, and when we don't tithe, the ministry is reduced and a fundamental uh, principle is at work where we only work with what we have. And we know God's unlimited resources, but God does his best work through you and me. And as we're generous in allowing God to work through us, we see that God starts to do something remarkable. In Malachi, though, uh, they weren't giving of their tithes, and so we find this, and I, I don't like infusing this into this message. However, I'll explain in verse eight, Malachi three, will you rob me, God is saying, will you rob God? Yet you were robbing me. You ask, how do we rob you by not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions? You are suffering under a curse, yet you, the whole nation, are still robbing me. Growing up, this was always the verse that was preached for the tithe Sunday. And I didn't like it because it always felt like a threat. I don't know if you read that like a threat, but I felt like it was a threat when I was reading it. It's like, hey, you're robbing me, and you're under a curse now. And it always felt like God was just mad. But I was reading this this week, and I saw it in a different way for some reason. If we were all standing in the middle of the street, Washington Avenue, and one of you didn't say, hey guys, we should probably get out of the street or we're gonna get hit by a car. You would be a terrible friend. One of us has to step up and say what everyone is probably needs to know, that God isn't making a threat. He's giving a warning. Hey, you're not doing what I've asked you to do. And with that comes the consequence of this curse. And many believe the curse was that it wasn't raining and that pests were coming to eat their crops. And, and God's saying, if you'll just stop robbing me, all of a sudden you'll find that things change dramatically. It was a warning. It wasn't a threat. It was a warning because God loves us so much, he warns us. But he doesn't just warn us. Furthermore, God gives us a promise. And I love throughout Genesis we find this principle at place where God keeps warning and, and punishing, but he also rewards and he blesses. And in Malachi 3.10, it says, bring the full tenth into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. He says, test me in this way, says the Lord of hosts. See if I will not open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing for you without measure. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not ruin the produce of your land and your vine and your field will not fail to produce fruit, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will consider you fortunate for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. God gives a promise. 
God says, I'm going to open up the floodgates. Many people believe because it hadn't been raining. He was going to open up heaven and rain was going to come. It was going to flood the earth and uh, it was going to uh, allow crops to grow and animals to be able to drink. He says, I'm going to uh, rebuke the devourer that's coming to eat your crops. Locusts are coming and they're, they're devouring everything and I'm going to put them at bay. I'm going to protect you and I'm going to provide for you exactly what you need. And then more. We don't know what God's blessings look like. Now, some people try to put God's blessings on there, and they say, well, if you'll just give, God's going to give you a whole lot more, and you're going to get rich and famous, and it's going to go well for you. And I'm not promising you that. I am promising you, though, that God will provide for you exactly what you need in the moment you need it if we'll be obedient and we'll walk in his word. And they didn't have the things they needed, and God provided the things once they were in alignment with him. They were obedient. But if we go back and we look at Cain, he wasn't willing to make the sacrifice, not fully he showed up, and he brought something. And, and this choice of his led to other compromises in his life, which led to greater sin. Which is exactly how things work. When we make compromises and we shortcut in certain areas, it leads to other compromises and other shortcuts. And yet God calls us to sacrifice. So what did Cain and Abel give? We look and it says, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and other fat portions. Both are giving some, but Abel is where we understand what Cain went wrong. Giving of the firstborn is trust, saying that God comes first. When you sacrifice the firstborn calf, you're trusting there's going to be a second calf. In fact, if you need that calf to grow in order to eat, sacrificing that calf becomes very compromising long term if another one doesn't come along. By giving of the firstborn, what he was saying was, I trust that God is gonna provide more for me in the future. We're so content with holding on to what we have, we have no idea what God wants to give us in the future, and yet if we'll let go of what we have and give to God, not just randomly or aimlessly, but give to God, we'll find that God creates a stronger and better future for us. So giving of the firstborn says, God, I trust you for more. I trust that you're gonna keep on providing that this is not all there is, and that's such a hard place to come to. But God keeps consistently reminding us he's in control, giving the fat portion says that God deserves the absolute best. He deserves the best. Not leftovers, not we'll see if I can get by and I'll give after that. God deserves the first and he deserves the best. Abel was giving the first and the best of what he had to God because he trusted that God was worth it and he would provide more. But many of us don't want to give what we have because we're afraid there's nothing coming behind that. I can't sacrifice this, I can't give that because I don't know what's going to happen. Cain, by contrast, was merely giving what was left over. He knows he needs to give something, but it's giving out of mere obligation and nothing more. No love or humility or passion or joy. He's just merely giving. And in Genesis 4, 6, it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you furious? Why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? God gives Cain another chance. And this is a reoccurring theme throughout the scripture, but specifically in Genesis, where God gives us a chance after chance after chance after chance. He gives him another chance to make things right. He gives him a second chance to give to him something that will be acceptable. He's encouraging him to change his heart, to change his attitude, to humble himself, and to be obedient to God. God isn't done with Cain, and he isn't done with us. He keeps giving us opportunities. And giving to God is less about actions, and it's more about heart motivation. What's the motivation behind it? Is it to try to twist God's arm, manipulate God, and get what we need from him? Is it to try to butter him up? Is it uh, to try to uh, control God? I'm giving to you, and you're not giving me anything back. All of our exchanges are uh, consistently uh, looked at as, what am I going to get for what I give? And so uh, what we do so often is, oh, God, what I've done this, what are you going to do for me? That our heart's motivation should be to live in obedience to God. I want to be obedient to God in all areas. And we become transformed by what we use our money for. We do. You want to change your uh, life? Change your wardrobe. Go with a wholly diff totally different look, a different haircut and everything. And it just changes your whole world. Different shoes, everything. It just shifts you. 
You want a new car? You get something with a convertible, you know, midlife crisis vehicle, whatever. I mean, just shift your whole mindset. All of a sudden, you're a new person. You feel good. We are conformed and transformed by what we spend our money on. And so often, the things that we own end up defining us. I am worth what I spend. I am what I buy, not what I invest. In Genesis 4, 7, it says, if you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It's desires for you, but, but you have to rule over it. There's effort and emphasis put back on us where sin is at the door, but you have to rule over it. You have to rule over the sin. God is asking a very honest question. If you just do what is right, won't you be accepted? We know that's the case through scripture, that if I do not give to God my best with my best intention, sin is waiting, and the sin of greed or laziness or the lust for more, the sin of being a consumer, it's just waiting. The temptation is there, and if we don't rule over it, then we'll fall to greed. We all have those sinful desires, but we have to rule over it. For Cain, his heart was corrupt, and out of corrupt heart came corrupt actions. And in Genesis 4, 8, it says, Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel, and he killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's guardian? Now, I'm not saying that if you don't live generously, you're going to murder someone. I want to make very clear that that is not the parallel that I'm trying to draw. I'm not saying that uh, hopefully, ideally, none of you have and or will ever become uh, murderers. And so uh, I don't want to say that. What I do want to say very clearly, though, is if we compromise in one area, it leads to compromises in other areas. And even though ideally we won't become murderers, we will find ways to uh, compromise in other areas. And what God is wanting us to do is to be obedient in all areas. That's the pursuit of holiness. That's what it looks like for us to be holy people, not compromising in any area. But if God knew Cain was going to be upset, if God knew in his infinite wisdom that he was going to kill Abel, why didn't he just accept his offering? Why wouldn't he just go, well, you know what, I mean, at least you tried. You showed up, man, you brought some produce, and I mean, I don't really like that. That's not the first or the best, but hey, uh, you, you, gave it, you gave it an effort, right? We love giving credit for efforts here in our modern society. So uh, there you go, A for effort. Uh, and if you look at the Old Testament, you see that this set off a chain reaction of terrible events, that, uh, of constant problems that still plague us today. And, and God could have stopped all of this if he had just accepted Cain's offering, except God knew that if he accepted Cain's offering, he would be setting the precedence for accepting anything less than the best. God knew he would be encouraging a habit of giving something less than our best. And God was setting things up for Jesus. Everything points us to the coming of Jesus and points to the, uh, the arrival of Jesus in scripture. God was setting us up to say, you can only come to me one way, and that's through Jesus. If he had accepted Cain's offering, he would have said, well, you can come to me any other way, and I don't care how often or when or whatever. You can just come to me any time. And God's saying, uh, very beginning of time, no, you come to me in one way, that we don't get to just come to God by any other means. But the beautiful thing about the tithe is that this is the only place in Scripture where God says, test me in this. He just says, test me. This is a real low, it's not like, hey, you test me. It's like, a, hey, just try it. See if I'm not obedient. See if I won't bless you. See if things won't change for you. Just test me in this. But here's what I know is generosity is not confined to this room. But it starts here. If we can't be generous with God, we'll never be generous with anyone outside the context of church. It starts here. And it's not just money, it's time, it's energy, it's effort, it's love, it's compassion, it's grace, it's mercy. How are we treating one another? Are we sending cards and texts and encouraging people? Are we finding people in the, the grocery store and, and, and letting them know they're loved by God? Like there's a lot of ways that we're generous, a lot of areas in our lives where we become stingy or greedy. But specifically this morning, we're talking about money. And so the question that I wanna leave with is what's in your hand? What are you holding on to? You can hang on to it and see what you can do with it. Or we can give it to God and see what he wants to do with it. But the choice is yours, the choice is mine, and we make this choice every time when we choose to give, whether it's online or in the room or in this way or that way, or with your time, with your energy, with your efforts. We're choosing, am I gonna hold on to what I have or am I gonna live open-handed lives? But God says, test me in this. See what happens. And let's all watch God do what God can only do. If you would bow your head and close your eyes this morning.